You're listening to The Streaming Wars, the podcast that discusses all of the latest happenings regarding your favorite streaming services. Find out which service is winning the war this time around. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of The Streaming Wars. I'm Dustin and Tony is with me and we're here to discuss everything from November 11th through December 1st. We have three weeks worth of news to cover. I mean, we hope you, the, our listeners here, here in the U.S., enjoyed the Thanksgiving break. And uh, those of you outside of the U.S., hopefully you guys enjoyed a little bit of a less news cycle, le- less busy news cycle because of what was happening here in the United States with the holiday. That being said, there is a bunch of news that happened, a lot of really big things that actually happened right before Thanksgiving in that week leading up to Thanksgiving that obviously we didn't talk about because we were, we were taking a break for two weeks. But there is a a lot of stuff to cover, so we're going to get straight into it. Starting off with Netflix, there's a feature film called Strangers that is moving forward at Netflix. Netflix has greenlit the fantasy film Damsel. There is a after show uh, series called the Netflix After Party, which is moving forward. This is Netflix diving into the after show business. Now, if you're unfamiliar with it, with what an after show is, there's a number of different series and well, I should say a number of different networks and services that are offering after show content specifically for their high profile shows. Netflix has tested the water with this. Uh, in the past, they've actually done one for Stranger Things as basically a series that's focused specifically on Stranger Things. But because of the way Netflix works with it being very much a binge type series with when it comes to everything, they're looking at doing an after show series that basically can pick up for a variety of different series that they release over time. So anything that they deem popular enough would probably get some sort of after show base, you know, as part of this series called the after the Netflix after party. So this is, this is big news because it means that more content for their really popular series should be coming very soon. Yeah. I think that this is a interesting idea. I mean, once again, we've seen Netflix within the past, probably would say like a month, two months really have taken some steps and we'll see later in the podcast just to, just taking more creative steps trying to reach out and it's pretty interesting I, I know when i got started within the walking dead and I, and I finally dropped off after a while they did after shows for the walking dead and then fear the walking dead they do the same thing and i know that those have pretty good reception and so um you've seen from time to time like other tv shows kind of having an after show part and it i think it's going to work very well, especially for different types of shows, like maybe like the big hits, Stranger Things, you know, and et cetera. I think that this is also good because they, they've they've known they known in the past that these after show ideas, these talk show ideas, have kind of failed on Netflix due to just the streaming business, and it doesn't necessarily make sense with a streaming service to have all this to have all this content that is you know time specific. And so attaching that to a television show, I think that this is really nice because even even as people watch back later, they can get you know a, a pretty good feel of what was happening, and they don't feel lost because it's not up to the current news, if you know what I mean. So I like this approach. I like the talk show idea. And I think it's going to be a pretty cool experiment. All right. Netflix has also ordered the uh, Spy Adventure series from Skydance TV starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Netflix has also landed an eight film deal with a Saudi Arabian production company. Netflix has also announced Arlo the Alligator Boy, which will be a feature and then have a follow up series as well. Netflix specifically has defended their show cancellations by stating, well, everyone does it. Man, what a segue into it. Yeah, I mean, I mean they do. Um, you know, a quote from Sarandos. You know, one of the reasons the success of Netflix is, you know, it's in TV shows is it's judging against an old metric. It seems that in this new age of television, the business model is a little bit different. The things that marked success prior to Netflix and OTT really had been going, you know, had had been getting to syndication to that point of syndication and the goal of 100 episodes. And that doesn't necessarily... Uh, match with with you know the streaming model. So I think he brings up some good points there because the models aren't the same, and I think it is a little bit unfair to try to compare with this different metric of success to the old way. Because trying to reach syndication, the point of syndication for these TV shows doesn't make sense when you're on Netflix and you can binge it anytime you want. And especially as they're going to own the streaming rights to more of their exclusive content, it's going to be on there for forever. So the the point is is 
it, it is a little bit unfair to judge against the old metric. And if that's the case, I'm curious what the new metric is going to be for success of cancellation of TV shows. But I'm still surprised that, you know, the, six, the 67% is within like the industry standard with the 67% renewal rate of TV shows is the industry standard because it really does feel like Netflix cancels, you know, a lot more shows. At least they cancel more bigger name shows, it seems like. You know, overall, Surrender says some good points and I, and I check out the people and I, and I encourage people to, to read this article and really see what he's saying. Yeah, and, and just to chime in, I, I will say it's 67% across the entire industry. So when you look at Netflix, if they're, that could easily be a higher number just because they're producing way more shows for their service than a single network is producing for their, for their network. So when they cancel more shows, it makes perfect sense because it's still a percentage. They're still canceling more shows. It's just the same percentage as a normal network that produces a fraction of what Netflix produces for their, for their service. So that makes perfect sense. I will say the one thing about the syndication that kind of bugs me is that while it is entirely true that when it comes to network television shows, of course, there is this desire to get to 100 episodes to the, to get to the syndication. That actually is a smaller number when it comes to syndication for animated cel- uh, television shows. Animated shows only need to believe get to be 52, I believe, in order to be in syndication. But the thing is, ultimately, it comes down to if you're looking at this and saying, well, this metric is outdated, we don't need to get to the standard of 100 episodes for syndication. That's absolutely true. However, it does cost to produce a brand new show that doesn't have 100 episodes. I mean, let's be honest here. There are still people who are watching Game of Thrones. Does Game of Thrones have 100 episodes? No, it certainly doesn't. But there's there are hour-long episodes each season. There's there's eight seasons. I think, I think there's like an average of eight episodes per season. So you're talking about like 64 episodes. There's a lot of Netflix shows that don't even get to like 30 episodes. And if that's the case, what in enticing people to go watch the show you know some of the really really successful shows more most recently the crown came out that's on the fourth season it has a lot of episodes there's a reason to deep dive back into the older episodes when you are looking at a show that only has two seasons or one season what would be the point of even taking a look at it and while netflix might own the rights to those shows for a long period of time it ultimately comes down to how are they really helping build their library if they're just having this one show that has eight episodes sit on their service. Maybe what they should be doing is focusing a little bit more on developing quality content that warrants the second, third, fourth, fifth seasons rather than having to cancel a show after its first or second season because it's just not succeeding the way they they want it to. They have a ton of data. Everybody talks about how Netflix is great about the algorithm, the data, and all of that. They need to use that information to create better shows and attract creators to create better shows that fit within the content that they're actually doing very well with. And that's that's just my opinion. Yeah, uh, to, to push back a little bit, one of the few times we have a, a difference of opinion, you, you know, you talked about them having data and they analyze it. You know, they have come out and said multiple times, but I, I remember them saying that, yeah, some of these shows do okay, but to reach the numbers that Netflix wants to reach and engagement and stuff like that, they realized that after the second or third, you know, season, if things are not kind of going their way, that the costs might not, you know, judge it, that it's actually potentially cheaper to just start a new show than to keep up with the old one. And this is partly due to, you know, around the second, you know, second season, you have these actors who, if they're, you know, established contract negotiations start up again, you know, other costs like that go up that are, I think are a little bit hidden. So I think that that's a point, point to push back. If, if the goal is um, to optimize, you know, business, you know, value, business revenue, um, the return on investment from these shows as 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 investments, then seeing them cancel stuff makes logical sense. If you have the paradigm of like Netflix is is optimizing for business values versus like customer you know relations, customer values, because I feel like what you talked about deals with like the customers viewing Netflix and in, in their content, whereas I feel like Netflix is just focused on not so much the customer side of things, but the business side of things, which is you know totally fair in one regard. So I understand where Netflix is coming from, and I can see their point of view. And for Netflix, it makes sense. But I do agree with you that as a customer, I would enjoy some of of these shows to have more seasons. I mean, I think Mindhunter is one of the biggest ones we could talk about recently is a show that has two seasons. It's a great show by David Fincher, but it 
doesn't seem like it's getting a third season because of Fincher and then Fincher doing his stuff, um, other stuff. But then also there's been like weird contract negotiations, weird, you know, budget issues with how much they're going to budget for the show and stuff like that. So um, I remember since eight, it kind of had a similar situation there of, of being popular among its its fans and they're, you know, a relatively decent group of fans, but wasn't like super crazy. And they canceled that show and it was a big, you know, hoopla about that. So um, yeah, I definitely see as a fan that some of these cancellations might seem premature. And in, in the syndication model, things kind of also make sense because if you get to 100 episodes, like obviously that there is an established fan base and people really enjoying it. So it, it's, I think it's a tough spot for Netflix to be in and because they're in between, you know, business values and, and business returns versus, you know, customer values and customer, you know, relations. Right. And my my final point on this is just going to be the one thing I will point out is that when you look at the Nielsen top 10 streaming uh, rankings consistently, the, you know, like the the hot thing of the week, whether the, whether it be like the Crown or whether it be the new Barat movie on Prime Video, those the the top spots are always dedicated to something that just came out. But typically, that stuff does drop off. The one thing that a lot of people have noticed if you if you watch the the rankings is that the shows that continuously show up on the top ten week after week after week are in fact series that are have they're boasting well over a hundred episodes that netflix is actually licensing from elsewhere like Grey's anatomy criminal minds uh shameless these are shows that consistently pop up in the top 10 because they're doing very well and it's because they have a lot of episodes and i'm not saying of course that you have to have a lot of episodes but they're warranting people to watch the service that has this because there's a lot more minutes that can be watched when there's a lot more episodes so I think there's counter arguments for both, but I think we both have valid points. So anyway, all right. So moving along, Judd Apatow will make his next feature film at Netflix. This is in contrary to everything he's done before about his films being theatrical releases. There are action. There's an action comedy feature called student driver that has been acquired by Netflix. That's going to be popping up in 2021. Sean Levy has found a new home for his production company at Netflix. Netflix has ordered the comedy series, the G word with M Conover and M Conover who previously had a show on True TV, and this is actually going to be co-produced by the Obama's production company as well. David Fincher has signed an exclusive deal with Netflix. This kicks off with his feature film Mank that is actually releasing this holiday season. You know, for Netflix, this is, I think, a solid move in terms of a creator on board with them. I mean, David Fincher, he did, you know, House of Cards, which kind of started Netflix's original content empire at at this point, just did the whole entire, you know, library of things. And then he also did Mindhunter and he's doing a bunch of other things right now. So from a creative standpoint, he's a good creator to have on board. But I'm curious... You know, over the past year or two since we started the show, we've mentioned different exclusive deals with, you know, different streaming providers, uh, stream- different streaming companies, and then also, you know, different executives, creatives, and whatnot. And I'm curious what, you know, the rate of return is. Like, I feel like we, we see all these agreements and stuff, and it's been a few years, and I don't know what these streaming services are getting. It, it doesn't feel like there's like an amount of content that warrants it. You know, Fincher might produce a few. This is the first time in a while I've heard him actually produce anything. So it just, you know, I'm curious what your opinion is. It just, for me, it doesn't seem like signing all these exclusive deals with these creatives is paying off for companies as much as I think they expect it would. I think the only company that these exclusive deals make sense for is Apple TV Plus. And the reason I say that is because one, Apple TV Plus has the cash to blow. They don't have any concerns about whether or not they're getting a return on the subscriber counts for Apple TV Plus at this immediate point. But they have signed an insane amount of creators to produce content for their service. And that is just going to be a gradual rollout. While they don't have a ton of series right now, they're going to have a ton of stuff coming in the next couple of years that is going to be coming from these exclusive deals. Netflix, however, I think they're beyond the point of they don't really need to have exclusive deals. I think, honestly, this David Fincher exclusive deal comes across as Fincher, if you look at his filmography from the past couple of years... He hasn't done a whole lot. He used to be churn out a movie every two years, every three years, and then gradually that time increased more and more and more. And the thing is, I'm not going to sit here and say that what he churns out isn't great. Some of my favorite movies of all time are David Fincher films, Gone Girl, Fight Club, Seven, 
it, these are great films. However, the thing is, when you look at what he's been doing the last couple of years, he's been involved with television series like House of Cards, obviously Mindhunter. He had that Love, Death, and Robots last year. But these are series that he's not like show running these series. He's just involved with them. He's producing them. He's helping them out. But he's not like all of his time isn't being eaten up by this. So the last time he produced a film was in 2014 with Gone Girl. And now he's got this mank. So I think ultimately he likes the pace that he can work at at Netflix and that's part of the reason why they did this. I also think that it has to do it has a lot to do with the fact that like he doesn't have he doesn't want to have to feel like he has to be pumping and work out all the time. I saw an interview when he was talking about Mindhunter season 3 because obviously he's involved with that series and he was saying, you know, I'm I'm just really busy. I don't have the time to really put into a season 3 and ultimately season 3 is going to come down to whether or not they have the money for to do what we want to do but if we do do a season 3 it's probably going to move real forward to the the serial killer that they've been hinting at for the first two seasons and and slowly focusing on because they just doesn't see them you know being able to do a season 4 so they would just get to that serial killer and that makes sense however he's not the one who's you know you know he's not doing everything with that series so it's not just the fact that he doesn't have time and if the show was successful enough obviously netflix could go and find another showrunner for it that gets the blessing they did that with house of cards it's not like it's entirely impossible so i I don't know i mean i think that this exclusive deal is kind of the exception to a lot of the ones we've been hearing because i think he's just comfortable with dealing with the people at netflix He's not being rushed to pump out work. And if you look at some of the other exclusive deals that Netflix has made, a lot of those other deals are, they're not like crazy pumping out work either. It's, you know, they're working at the pace that they want to work at and they're not being forced to pump out a significant amount of work every single year, which makes perfect sense for Netflix. But money wise, it only makes sense for these exclusive deals to be happy at Apple just because they have the money to blow. Netflix, they're limited on how much money they can spend on these exclusive deals and it just feels unnecessary for them given their place in the in the industry. All right, so then moving right along, Netflix is a developing a 40 Acres film. Netflix has also set the animated comedy film Back to the Outback, which is coming out next year. Charlie Booker's next Netflix projects will be a 2020 mockumentary. Netflix is working on a Korean adaption of Money Heist. And then finally with Netflix, they are testing TikTok-like clips in the mobile app. So if you pull up Netflix, you'll see small snippets of, you know, bits of stand-up that they've had from a number of their stand-up specials, but showcasing like a specific joke or some sort like you would see on TikTok. This is, uh, once again, another move of trying new things out. I think this is going to be really good because, you know, stand-up, I think comedy is probably the best best way to showcase this ability of these these clubs. Um, for instance, on YouTube, The Office, right? This show's been you know, off the air for a long time, but The Office YouTube channel actually just cuts favorite m- moments of the office into these bite-sized clips and you get to see like Dwight trying to do CPR on a dummy and then takes take it uh its head off his face off and try to do the Hannibal Lecter impression like it's just so ridiculous that it's only like a two-minute clip and it's just it's just a whole bunch of fun and you see another good example is like the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon of the different moments that he does of reading the tweets and all the games that he plays those are just fun moments and snippets and you don't have to go through the rest of the show like the rest of uh, Jimmy Fallon's just you know talk shows and stuff that might not be interesting to people and you just can see just the fun little bits so for comedy I think it's going to be great so it's a great way to showcase all the stand-up specials that they have you don't have to listen to some of all, all the bad jokes but you get to enjoy a lot of those good moments so on a mobile this might be a really good idea if it's good on mobile maybe that there's a way that they can do it somehow with you know on the TV version but overall this is a really cool idea all right so jumping over to Prime Video Amazon is looking to adapt the Yes Daddy novel there's an animated comedy series called Oaklandia that is in development with Snoop Dogg and Vince Vaughn attached. Amazon is expanding their original programming to Amazon's Kids Plus, which is the former Amazon Free Time Unlimited. They renamed it Amazon Kids Plus. Basically, they're creating original content exclusively for the Amazon Fire Kids tablets. If you if your child has one of those Amazon Kids tablets, the first year that you have it, you get a free subscription to Free Time Unlimited, which is now called Amazon Kids Plus. But they're creating original content. One of the original content they're creating is an animated series featuring Ryan from Ryan's World, which is a very, very popular YouTuber and has his own line of merchandise that's actually sold in 
big box stores and things like that. So they're actually creating original content now specifically for that small of an audience. Even though it's not obviously a small audience, the amount of kids that are on tablets is is a growing, growing, growing audience. But the original content is something that they really haven't branched that much into. There's been plenty of content that's been adapted for Amazon into their, you know, into their ecosystem. But this is the first time original content is actually being being created specifically for that that small ser- section of Amazon. All right, uh, the Amazon is also producing a biopic for the band Heart, and then Coming to America, which has been rumored to be coming to Prime Video, is officially coming to Prime Video in March of 2021. A lot of people were expecting Amazon to announce that this was going to be coming out around Christmas, based off of what we've heard. We'll talk about HBO Max in a little bit, but also Disney Plus is releasing Soul, so a lot of expectations for the big streamers to release a large blockbuster type movie or at least blockbuster to the degree of streaming on their service around Christmas time to compete. It doesn't look like this is going to be the film that's going to do that for Prime Video. And it actually looks like outside of Disney Plus and HBO Max, there isn't really going to be big movie releases on the streaming services outside of the movies that are just normal films that are expected. This was the one film Prime Video probably was expected to do, but it's not going to be coming till March. Jumping over to Hulu, it was announced, and this is hard to believe, but this was about three weeks ago, right after we recorded our last episode, the numbers from Disney were released and Hulu has announced that they have topped 36 million subscribers. Next, Hulu has is developing a dramedy series called Out There. They've also secured the U.S. streaming rights for the film Boss Level, which will be coming in sometime in 2021. And then finally, Hulu's live television offering is raising their prices. It's jumping up to $65, which is the price that YouTube TV recently also just jumped up to. This is a bad move. I- I feel like in we've seen YouTube TV increase their prices now. Hulu TV is increasing their prices. As a consumer, it, it's and I use you know YouTube TV and I was going to switch to Hulu, but now it's about the same price. I, I think it's a little bit too much because now you're paying. I feel like we're we're now we went back. We we're trying to cut cable right, and now we basically got cable on broadband. Um, we have all these channels that we're not watching. You know, I pretty much only watch four channels on YouTube TV. Hulu TV would be the same thing. That's why I talk about them the same. It's just too much. And, and I, I wish that there's a different way to have these different packages where you can get certain channels with which and not have them all combined into one because $65 is a lot compared to the other streaming services that are out there. And then you have to add YouTube TV plus if you want like live TV for sports and, and whatnot. It, it's, it's a lot. I wish it was back to, you know, I think the $50 range, you know, felt good for, you know, my wallet and probably a lot of people's wallet, but 65, that's just that's a lot, and I can only see them pushing it. And I'm curious, what is that point when then they stop when they start losing subscribers? Because that's a really showing point. But you know, they're going to increase that price until they start losing and back off a little bit. But as a as a consumer, I'm very sad and upset with this news that Hulu, the the leader in live TV streaming, has raised the price because I feel like other you know services like you know Sling and whatnot are going to do the same thing. So <laughs> just disappointed. Yeah. Ultimately, it's just going to continue to rise until more and more people decide to start cutting the cord from the live television offerings altogether. The problem is that the only real solution for this is to start to, you know, to have the media companies stop forcing the bundling of the other channels that a lot of people don't use, but that's not going to happen, unfortunately, for quite some time. As we talked about on our last episode, here's a nice little plug. Go check it out. The death of cable television and the rise of streaming. So with that being said, there is nothing for Paramount Plus, Apple TV Plus. Apple has struck a deal to air the Peanuts holiday specials on PBS. Obviously, one of them was the Thanksgiving special, which has already happened, but the Christmas special will also be airing on PBS as well. This isn't to counter the negative PR probably that they received after the Halloween special was only available on Apple TV+. Plus. Even though it was available for free for a couple of days around, it still created a negative PR storm for them. It was one of the things that just kept popping up week after week after week after they were announced that they were going to be coming to the service. Apple has also boarded the upcoming film featuring the story of Tetris. There is also a series called Surface that is given that has been given a straight to series order as well. Jumping over to Disney Plus, as I mentioned, the Disney Plus numbers are out and they have grown to almost 74 million subscribers as of the end of September. That's so much within a year. That's so much. And as of I believe it's December 
11th or 12th, I think it's the 12th, they're having an investor summit for Disney, specifically focusing on streaming. So they're going to be talking about Hulu, ESPN+, Plus, Disney+, Plus, their upcoming star, which they're hoping to be the version of Hulu that will be worldwide. But they're supposed to be focusing a lot on that, and they're going to have updated numbers specifically up through the first entire year, because that $74 million isn't actually up until within the first year. So there's a good chance that that number is going to increase. It also means that some of the most recent additions to Disney+, Plus, I should say Disney+, Plus offering the, the service to other countries, specifically. Specifically, Latin America and, and areas in South America, which launched just after their last quarterly earnings port, that they'll have numbers for that as well. So I think that ultimately we're going to see a number for the first year, but then they're going to say, well, we were at this number for the first year, but we've also launched in these other areas, and now we're at this because it's far, far enough along where they could be giving numbers through the end of November, which are going to be pretty high. So there's a good chance that they could get up to about $85 million by the end of November. All right. There was also also some comments about the Mulan paid video on demand results and the Disney CEO Bob Shapak has said that he was quite pleased with the results from it. He didn't he did say that he does not have any expectations in the immediate future to put any other films for a paid video on demand or premiere access on Disney Plus, but they were pleased by the results from the film. You know, I'm part of some internet communities where it's about you know films and you know nerdy stuff like that and there's been some discussion among those that they couldn't believe that disney would do something with mulan and just there's been a lot of controversy with mulan but even still like if you were to watch the movie and try to give an objective rating for it it is probably a b minus at best it's very beautiful but there's still some structural issues with the film itself so between just a bunch of different things and you're already paying for disney plus and an extra, you know, $30 on top of that for Mulan. They just didn't feel like it was worth it. I understand, you know, the community's issues with the paid video on demand issue. But for Disney, you know, it's experimentation. Like you have to try something during this time of COVID. It's just been very crazy. So um, I appreciate them for trying something new. And I think this is a success. Maybe it isn't a huge success monetarily. Maybe they, they, they cover at best the production budget. You know, that's not even including marketing. Um, and how much they marketed it. Like it, it might not be a home run in terms of revenue, but I think if they can get a decent return, a, a decent amount of money for, for Mulan, which is, you know, a mid tier film in my opinion, in terms of quality and also reception by the, you know, the audience. Imagine what if they did like Black Widow or one of their other bigger movies that's going to happen, or as we're going to touch in a second, like live action remakes that have more general audience appeal, potential for more people even being interested. So I think that this was an interesting case study. And I think that JPEG is going to take the results from it, maybe not the monetary value to the return that they got back from Mulan, but I think they learned that there is a willingness within the streaming community and subscribers to pay a little bit extra for movies. I think that's what he I think Disney found. And I think that's the most encouraging point of view. Because if you think about some of these, you know, companies, you know, they've had to sit on films, Black Widow for Disney, Marvel, you know, HBO Max, I mean, for Warner Media, they've had to sit on Wonder Woman for a long time now. And and those are just kind of big investments that they're not able to get any return on. So even getting some positive return from paid video on demand, I think is is an interesting strategy to take. And I appreciate Disney for taking that leap. And I'm curious, you know, if they're going to have more plans for this or if they're just take it as interesting use case and put on the back burner and just move forward. And the biggest thing to show that they're, at least for now, they're putting on the back burner is because they're releasing Soul, which was one of their big films that would have released in theaters for free on Christmas Day. And then obviously they moved Black Widow, which is another one of their big films. They moved that film to next year, still hoping for a theatrical release. But if things don't get better, you know, there's only a matter of time before we're going to see potentially some other films also come to the service. They've already adjusted certain films. Obviously, Artemis Fall was another film that came out that was originally supposed to be in theaters. That one, they moved to Disney Plus for free. Mulan was really the first big one that, you know, warranted any sort of blockbuster type of expectation return because of how much money they spent to make it. When you look at Soul, it costs a significant amount of money, but nothing like nothing like Mulan or Black Widow. So I could see why they would do that. Also because they need to make sure that they have something to draw people in, especially around the holidays. People can buy a Disney Plus subscription for 
somebody else, and then they'll immediately have something to watch right away. All right, that being said, the Disney executive team is set, is said to be all in on the massive reorganization and the Disney Plus focus. This was due to some things that have changed recently. The series The Mysterious Benedict Society is moving moving from Hulu over to Disney Plus. Disney Plus has put the Darkwing Duck reboot in development. They've had good success with rebooting DuckTales for the Disney Channel, and now it's going to be they're going to be doing something very similar for Darkwing Duck. Disney Plus is furthering its reach with the launch in Latin America, as I mentioned earlier, launched in Latin America and Brazil. And then finally, Disney is considering pivoting live action remakes of specific animated films to Disney Plus, specifically Pinocchio, Cruella, and Peter Pan and Wendy. These are films that were ex- ex- expected to go to theaters, but because of, I guess, the budget range that they, they cost, they're considering instead of continuously marketing these films towards a theatrical release to immediately move them over to Disney Plus. Now, this is not unheard of because this has already happened. Lady and the Tramp was one of the films that actually launched Disney Plus, and that was a live action remake, obviously, of Lady and the Tramp. But obviously, Disney has had very high success with certain films. Beauty and the Beast and Lion King both grossed well over a billion dollars for the for the studio. So there are certain films that if they think that they can they're gonna be able to do very well, they're gonna keep them for theatrical. These films, however, Pinocchio, Peter Pan, and and the Cruella, focusing on Cruella DeVille from 101 Dalmatians, they're looking at these films and saying, well, these probably aren't films that are gonna make a billion dollars for us. So maybe if they're only gonna make a half a billion dollars in, in the theaters, maybe we move them over to Disney Plus instead and use those as a way to bring in more subscribers. Jumping over to Quibi. Quibi, uh, there's there's not a whole lot with Quibi, but I found this article over at The Verge that talks about Quibi's final days. Definitely read it. It's it's amusing for those of you who love to see Quibi fail. Uh, HBO Max. Uh, okay, so we're going to get into a situation where, obviously, like I said, the last time we had an episode was three weeks ago, so there's some articles here that came out that we would have talked about if we had an episode, but then were preempted by something else. So the first one was, there's an article that popped up talking about whether or not... Wonder Woman 1984 could be the Christmas release that HBO Max needs. Well, as it turns out, as we'll get to in a minute, it is what HBO Max needs, at least according to AT&T and Warner Media, because it's in fact happening. But before we get to that, the big news, however, probably of the last three weeks before Wonder Woman was announced for HBO Max, was that HBO Max is finally on Amazon Fire devices. They actually announced this on a Monday, and by Tuesday, all Amazon devices had HBO Max. My kids rejoiced because they could finally watch HBO Max on their tablets, which they've been bugging the heck out of me since HBO Max launched because of the specific kids content that HBO Max offers. So it's available on, on Amazon devices, which is great news. Now, of course, the the ball is in Roku's court because now outside of Roku, which currently has about 45% of the market share when it comes to streaming devices, HBO Max is in fact available on all devices outside of Roku, which still obviously makes up a huge market share. Yes, finally, come on, Roku. Let's let's make a deal. But I would make a, an observation as we're recording the week that we're recording this. Black Friday was a few days ago. It's a big sale of just everything before Christmas, and then Cyber Monday is the the Monday following, and it's still another thing where people have tons of discounts and stuff. And Amazon has extended you know the Cyber Monday deals for you know a few weeks now, <laughs> and, and so this HBO Max deal comes right at the beginning of this big push to buy stuff for Christmas. And so I think Amazon realized, hey, well let's let's make a deal with HBO max just to even encourage people even more so to get amazon fire devices for christmas time so i, I think that, that was a big push of why they want to get this deal done so quickly you're, you're absolutely right and that's that's honestly one of the reasons that it would make a lot of sense when you look at the other device that i personally like touting which is the google chrome or the google tv with chromecast that device didn't actually have any sort of black friday sales so like you it's a great deal it's a very reasonably priced but they didn't have any special so there was there was some really great analysts out there that were making comments about whether or not HBO Max could do some sort of deal where they could team up with Google Chrome or Google TV with Chromecast, offer like a three-month subscription to HBO Max for free, bundled with the Google TV with Chromecast, which would have been a great deal, except for the fact that if they would have done that, they would have immediately like put a wrench into any plans of getting on Amazon devices or Roku devices if they did that, that deal. Now, that's not to say they couldn't do that deal in the future with a device, whether it be Google or Amazon 
or whatever. But for the right now, I don't think the timing was would be good on that just because they don't have those other deals in place. And that is very, very important for them to get on those other devices specifically to grow their subscriber counts. So the next bit of news, HBO Max has ordered a weekly variety show from Conan O'Brien. It was also announced that Conan O'Brien is leaving TBS after 10 years of having a late night show there. And he's coming over to HBO Max to produce not only this variety show, but he's also producing a number of other content. Specifically, he's producing a number of stand-up specials that's already been previously announced. He's going to be working a lot more on hand for HBO Max. Then the biggest news, uh, which somehow, I don't know how the HBO Max and Amazon could have been not been the big news, but the biggest news was that Wonder Woman 84 has landed on HBO Max and will be in theaters as well on December 25th. They're actually doing a simultaneous release, so so if you are an HBO Max subscriber, you can watch Wonder Woman 1984 on Christmas Day free of charge. It's not going to cost you any extra money to watch it. You just have to be a subscriber of the service. If you choose to go to theaters or you live in an area that allows you to go to theaters, given what's going on with the pandemic, you will actually be able to still be able to see in theaters that are offering it, but uh, it will be available at the exact same time as it is in theaters on HBO Max, which is huge news by itself, outside the fact that this is a huge movie it's been delayed since june and a lot of people weren't expecting this i think there was a lot of film industry analysts that were looking at this and saying this is a horrible idea we should just put this to you know move it to next year there's not a whole lot of other stuff that you can you know there's a lot of other films that obviously have been pushed as well but you're there's this is the potential of making a billion dollars you are you really going to pass that up and at the same time there's streaming analysts that are looking at this and saying this is a huge way to get subscribers to check out each HBO Max, especially if they land a Roku deal before the holidays, because basically everyone then will have the ability to get HBO Max on their device. But in, on top of that, they'll be able to check out because I think a lot of streaming analysts have acknowledged that HBO ha HBO Max has an insanely great library. There's a ton of content there. There's a lot of content that will keep people around for a long period of time, but you have to see it to believe it. In other words, you have to have some reason to bring you to the service, and this could be it. A lot of people assumed the Friends reunion was going to be it. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet. It will, but it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, Wonder Woman 1984 is that huge advantage to get people to check the service out and then hopefully keep them around. Yeah, uh, I remember I, I tweeted you, uh, no, I sent you the tweet of Patty Jenkins, the director of her confirming, and I remember you, you just couldn't even believe just just these this news. I mean, it, it is very huge and HBO and Warner Media is just taking a big risk. Just looking at where things are right now, I mean, they kind of have to. Either they sit on it and wait, or they release it and maybe make the best of it and just kind of write it off. So I feel like there's no win-win situation here because, especially in the United States, what the biggest market internationally for movies, it would have made just a fraction of what it could have just normally. So is it better to... You know, release it or is it better to just um, do it on the streaming service? My concern is that unlike a TV show like The Mandalorian, which takes, you know, a few a month or two to finish because it's it's done sequentially every every week, you know, dropping a movie like this. Yes, we'll get subscribers, a lot of, you know, eyes, you know, for the first, you know, day or two. But I'm concerned that, yes, there might be a lot of signups. But what is the, the churn rate after that? Can HBO Max convert these people who want to watch Wonder Woman in 1984 for long-term customers? And will they cancel after the first month? That is what, to me, if they, they, re, if they keep a, a decent percentage of you know those customers, I think that that's going to be a huge win for HBO Max. And it's going to be a good sign for Warner Media of like, okay, like this, this strategy worked. But if they're not able to hold on to the subscribers for more than a month or two, then this might be considered a flop in that regard because it got a lot of eyes it made hbo max really popular people were talking about it but if they can't keep customers or land new ones after the fact because of just this word of mouth that's going to happen then this is kind of all for nothing so that to me is the only concerning part of this whole entire deal is that yes they're foregoing a pile of cash that could happen in the future with you know releasing it in a bigger fashion but that's an undetermined time of when they're going to get the cash or they can take this risk now get gain subscribers promote hbo max but there's still the risk afterwards of, of a huge turn rate. You know, that's kind of how I view the situation. And it's, it's a pretty delicate one. Hopefully HBO Max is able to keep those people around. Yeah. And honestly, I hate to say this, but Wonder Woman 1984 has become basically a marketing write-off for HBO Max. So that's ultimately what it is. And I'm not saying anything 
bad against the film. I'm looking forward to seeing the film. Obviously, I'm not saying anything bad about HBO Max because I love the service. But it is this film could have potentially made a lot of money if it came out in theaters. And it's obviously not going to. But when you look at what happened recently with Tenet insisting on Tenet going to theaters, it releasing in theaters, and that was during a time where the pandemic, you know, obviously the numbers are ticking back up now. But before when Tenet came out, the numbers were actually ticking down. So like that was a time where more people could have seen it, but they weren't. They weren't going to the theater even if they could. And that film did only made, I think, $54 million in the U.S., when in you know pre-pandemic world, that film probably would have made you know three hundred million dollars in in the U.S. because of how you know the type of film that it was. So unfortunately, that's just not happening. And the thing is, because numbers are ticking back up, yeah, there's word about vaccines, and that's all great. But whether or not the vaccine is actually entirely viable, and how quickly that actually is dispersed to the public, and actually can bring all of the stuff that's well, happened from the pandemic back to normal, that's that's far out at this point. I mean. Even- even, even going off the vaccine part, I, I just I feel like consumers are just not comfortable going to theaters and, and taking that risk, even if a vaccine comes out and, and stuff like that. I mean, I feel like the world will start turning back to normal in 2022. Yeah. And so do you do you wait all the way to 2022 or do you just do it right now? Because even if, if things go decently well, people still have the skepticism of, of everything that's going on and they're going to not go to the theaters. That's, that's a pretty good bet that I'm going to make because they still want to do social distancing. They don't want to go out. They're just... You you know, scared. There isn't, you know, that confidence of you know, going out in public again. So even with, you know, the best situation, it's probably 2022 before you can get, you know, a lot of butts and seats and make a good profit in the theaters. And even then there's, there's an opportunity, there's a, there's a huge possibility that movie theaters in you know, all large chains and stuff might go bankrupt. And so, you know, the world might turn back to normal and you want to get, you know, this film distributed, but you're going to have a smaller section, a smaller um, number of theaters to even distribute this. And that's going to hurt your, you know, bottom line because there's less you know seats available so that's a huge thing to realize too is you know as we wait to 2022 essentially as things go back to normal you might not even still get a good box office because there's limited seating so there's just a lot of factors here and and it's just it's almost like pin the tail on the donkey there's there's some good options and then there's some bad options and you know maybe it works out maybe it doesn't but you have to make some decision if you're if you're in a situation where it's very unclear which way to move forward at least going in a direction is more progress than just standing still and honestly them trying to get more subscribers to HBO Max is not necessarily a bad thing because if it does work, bringing people to the service because of this film, if this film is in some ways, as some analysts have called it, the sacrificial lamb to get people to check out HBO Max, that might be a good idea just because if the numbers continue to tick up and the vaccine's still months away, we're talking about going into winter here. We're talking about, you know, potentially having even higher numbers of cases and even more quarantines and lockdowns and things like that. I'm not saying this is specifically have to do with it, but if you look at Disney Plus's numbers, they've done incredibly well with the amount of growth that they've had in the year and obviously they had no idea that it was they were going to grow as well as they did but a lot of that had to do with or at least in my opinion it has to do with the fact that the pandemic happened when it did and the service is available and has a large amount of content that people are going to check out and of course kids are going to watch HBO Max maybe they don't have as much kid content as as Disney Plus but when you compare what HBO Max has to what Netflix has and you look at the price that Netflix is now that they've raised their prices recently it's pretty comparable so then maybe you get rid of netflix and you just keep and you switch over to hbo max you know there, there's that there's that thought there so i'm i'm only hoping that you know because of the way things are going with wonder woman 84 if the the route goes the way everybody seems it looks sees it going with the pandemic getting potentially bad again then maybe this is hbo max's way of trying to get subscribers into the service to try to help warner media start making some money rather than not having any films out there releasing so there's that all right so moving right along hbo max has given a series order to the adaption of dmz which is a dc comics series uh hbo max has also ordered a docuseries focusing on Nicki minaj hbo max has greenlit the last of us series which is based off of the video game series widely popular series on playstation amazon will remove the hbo channel next year now this is pretty big news because if you remember one of the reasons why amazon and roku weren't very adamant about 
making a deal with HBO Max as well as Peacock was because Amazon and Roku wanted HBO to have a channel within their service. They did not want to have an app. They wanted the channel to still exist. And the reason why Amazon and Roku want that is because when they have the HBO as a channel, they're actually getting part of the revenue from the subscription every single month. Now, that's not to say that Amazon wouldn't be getting some sort of revenue cut from the HBO Max signups that they get. However, it's not the same. And the big point of contention, of course, was that HBO Max wanted their subscribers in their native app, not somewhere else. And the reason why is because they get the data from that app, not from the channels that are available on other services. So this was a big point of contention. So the real question is, if Amazon made the deal with HBO Max, HBO Max is now on Amazon, and next year the HBO channel will no longer be available on Amazon, and it will be basically replaced by HBO Max. The real question is, what did HBO Max have to give to Amazon in order to make this happen? Because it seems like Amazon is the one who's losing out on this, which was the reason why they didn't want to make the deal in the first place. So the only thing that can, the only thing that makes sense is that they're getting some sort of a, a nicer commission on the signups or something like that, because there's not a whole lot they can offer outside of potentially discounted licensed content from elsewhere in the Warner Media Library. Yeah, you know, just as a good business rule, if you have, you know, this data, either it could be like user data or just the product itself, you know, the movies and the TV shows, if you don't control that user experience, um, that's not a situation that you kind of want to be in. Um, you you kind of want to own that part of, of you want to call it like the, the whole business stack. You, you want to have <clears throat> all those components together because you control how viewers you know, view it, you're not, you're, you're limiting the points of failure because if you mess up on the user experience side, well, then that's clearly HBO's fault and you can, you know, change that and work it out. But if it's based on Amazon and they're in control, well, then you're kind of just at the mercy of them. So I, I totally understand why HBO Max had this fight and I, I appreciate it. And it's, it's good that they finally signed that deal and all that. It, it, it just makes sense. So yeah, Amazon will move the HBO channel. They said that, you know, the HBO app on the Fire TV will automatically upgrade to the HBO Max app. So basically how other apps have done that. They say that new customers can also subscribe to HBO Max directly in the app, which is, you know, pretty nice. You don't have to go to your computer, then log in, create the account. You can just do it all from there, which is just really great for customers. And, you know, they will be able to get, you know, HBO Max via the Fire TV and Fire tablets using their existing Sting login. So that's kind of the deals of this. That's the details of, of what's happened here. Yeah, I am curious, you know, like what what the what uh, HBO Max had to give up. But overall, I think this is a great deal. All right. Moving right along, HBO Max is, re- is releasing the remaining episodes of the HBO series Industry Early. Now, there is five total episodes that would continuously air on Sunday nights. But f- for some reason, I guess they decided this is another marketing opportunity, especially because these released over Thanksgiving weekend and there was also obviously the large marketing push that they were having with the Warner Media cable channels as well as the fact that they had not only the flight attendant and super intelligence to HBO Max originals released that weekend too so they're just adding more and this has been a suggestion actually from some uh, some analysts out there that have actually suggested that HBO Max if they were really looking to make sure that people wanted to use HBO Max and you know they're still just using HBO and they're not really utilizing the fact that they can activate their account into an HBO Max account. They're really looking to get those people to cross over. Why not have some sort of incentive for the people who are already watching content on HBO to use HBO Max? And one of the incentives that has been suggested is that, well, why not release some content early on HBO Max? Why not release it like a day early or two days early? Because they've already done that in the past with HBO Now. In the past, they've actually had series that have released episodes two days earlier than they actually air on broadcast on the app. It's not high profile uh, series, but they have done it. So it makes sense that this would be the case. However, this is the first one that is actually, they've actually done it with releasing the final episodes of the season prior to them actually airing on broadcast, which is a big deal because the show has garnered some critical acclaim. All right. So then HBO Max has also acquired Amazon's Spanish thriller La Juria. Then there is a BBC drama called The Trial of Christine Keeler that is going to be making its way to HBO Max as well because they've secured the 
the streaming rights for that. And then finally, Godzilla vs. Kong could be the latest tentpole film likely headed to streaming. Now, this popped up the week after Wonder Woman 1984 was announced to be coming to HBO Max. And the question, of course, becomes, well, what, what, what can HBO Max, as we were talking about earlier, what can they do to ensure that churn does not occur? How do they keep the customers? And the biggest way to keep customers is to make sure that they have more content that is exclusive to HBO Max to keep people around. Now, how do you do that? Well, you release other th- other things that you know are very high profile. And one of the ways to do that is you could do it with other films. Now, I can't say this would be the case with a lot of big pro- high profile films because there is that line of how much money can you actually walk away from just to release it. But Godzilla vs. Kong is a unique example specifically be- for a couple of reasons. One, the previous films are all currently streaming on HBO Max. The other aspect of this is that Warner Brothers is in charge of the distribution of Godzilla vs. Kong. It is a co-production with Legendary, but they're in charge of the distribution. So if they choose to sell it to streaming, they're uh, they're allowed to do that because they've already footed the bill for they've already foot their part of the bill for the production, but they're in part their charge of the distribution is part of the deal that they have with Legendary. So this film could end up there too. But this is also a film that's not necessarily going to make a billion dollars. It's not as high profile as, as Wonder Woman 1984 or some other films that Warner Brothers has coming soon. This film, I think the last one made like 325 somewhere around there is the last is how much the last one made 325 million which is is obviously a good chunk of money but that is you know as long as their budget was reasonable this could be one of the films that could be on the service now there's word on the street that netflix actually offered 200 million dollars to have this film come to netflix and warner media has actually said you know what wait We're not sure we want to do that, and the reason why is because they're contemplating on whether or not they want it to come to HBO Max. So could it end up on streaming? Entirely possible. I personally love this this the series the recent series of Godzilla and and King Kong movies, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, we'll see. All right, Peacock. Peacock has launched a linear channel for Saved by the Bell, specifically the new Saved by the Bell reboot launched over Thanksgiving weekend. Leading up to that, they had added one of their free channels to air episodes of Saved by the Bell. Jumping over to niche streaming services, Stars and Epics are approaching streaming very differently. Uh, This article is over at the Streamable. It's talking about how they're both looking at streaming and the perspectives that they have going forward. They're not looking at growing as large as say CBS All Access slash Paramount Plus or HBO Max they're looking at it from a very different perspective ESPN Plus has grown to over 10 million subscribers that is the latest numbers coming out of the Disney quarterly results there's a new streaming service that is focusing on black creators that has been announced it is in fact called Black Tag this is interesting especially as there as the streaming service is coming out kind of as you know the BET streaming services is kind of you know getting its foot off the ground as well and you know really trying to grow so this is interesting that you would have this as well i'm i'm a little bit concerned that you know the target you know demographic is you know a very small younger african americans just seems like a very a very small group to target so i bet it's going to have good content i bet it's going to appeal to who they're trying to reach for but as a successful business especially a streaming which it, it takes a while to get profitable i'm just concerned that they're setting themselves up for failure by just reaching so narrowly um, just as the demographic for the trying to target. All right, then Sony has acquired the faith-based streaming service called Pure Flix that focuses on Christian content. There's also Discovery is is finally Finally, they say. I mean, as we're recording this, they've already done it. But Discovery is set to unveil their streaming service on December 2nd. So hopefully next episode we'll have details on that since we've only seemingly been talking about it for ages. It is finally happening. So now it's just, is it any good? <laughs> that's that's the most important part. If you've had all this time to prepare, um, you better deliver a pretty good product. All right. And then as far as any other discussions to talk about, there's just one real quick thing that popped up. Universal has struck a new theater deal to bring movies 
streaming to streaming faster. And this is basically between them and the theaters. They've already had a deal in place that it's a very interesting when you look at Universal and 2020 and theaters, those three things combined have been such a roller coaster at the beginning of the pandemic. We had Universal and theaters being a completely opposite side saying uh, the theaters being super upset with Universal releasing Trolls World Tour to paid video on demand because the theaters were closed. The theater owners were super ticked about that, boycotting future Universal films specifically because of it to mid-pandemic when the theaters realized they were absolutely screwed, them coming up with a deal to basically allow films to get to streaming quicker or to bring films to the theaters at different times that work alongside of the, the current confines of the pandemic to now they're basically the brand new deal that's in place is that if a film does not bring in a specific box office allotment through the theaters in a given time then the sh- then the film is allowed to be put on to paid video on demand much sooner but this is a big deal because going forward in the future this is going to make a difference when it comes to certain films releasing obviously this deal was announced and then obviously Wonder Woman 1980 84 was announced to be coming to HBO Max the same time it was releasing in theaters, which most theater owners applauded, which would have never happened six months ago because they were all said 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 it was blasphemy and they were you know the the studios were screwing over the theaters. But theaters have had to adapt, and this is one of the unique ways that they've been doing it. Yeah, I just want to point out this is just with Cinemark as one of the theater chains, not with like AMC and some of the other big ones. So I just want to point that out. And yeah, uh, 17 days of theater exclusive. But if it earns more than fifty million, it's got to stay theaters for you know thirty-one days. I, I'm just curious if this is going to pan out as well as people think. Um, Seventeen days of theater exclusivity. Yeah, that's that's two weeks and you know a few days. I'm just not sure that that's and it, then it has to raise fifty million dollars. And if it reaches more, then it's at the, you know has to stay a month. I, I don't know how that's any different than some of the deals that we've seen currently. Like I don't I don't understand how this is a you know a true net positive. I know it's different than you know the norms and customs that have been pre pandemic, but as you know we've seen lately, it, it just seems not that good for you know I think the streaming services. If their goal is to push out content on the streaming services as fast as possible, but their you know hands are still tied due to agreements with you know theater chains. I don't see how this is necessarily benefiting Universal Pictures uh, as much as I think this article is trying to, to point up a little bit. So that's like my one big concern. And it's also interesting, I, I didn't realize this, but through the deal with AMC and this deal with Cinemark, Universal will give you know, a cut of its revenue in the U.S. as part of this partnership. So that's also very interesting that Universal is also going to pay these theater chains due to their profits as well. I found that a pretty just interesting detail. Does it really affect my, you know, analysis of the situation? Just was like, okay, like Universal is, you know, also going to have to pay out a little bit of money. So that's that, that to me was surprising. All right. And with that, that is everything for this episode. There's been a lot of news, obviously, over the past three weeks. Obviously, one of those weeks was a little bit less news just because of the holiday uh, just as a forewarning, at the end of December, we will be taking another two-week hiatus because of Christmas and New Year's, so just be prepared for that. But we will be bringing all the news leading up to that, and those two weeks typically are very very low on news, even more so than what we just had. So with that being said, we do have a couple of more episodes before the holidays roll around. Please check out the show notes. There is a ton of articles, obviously, that we talked about here, and then there is a ton of trailers. There's actually something like 60-something trailers that have released in the past three weeks because there's just an insane amount of content that's coming in the month of December. As we get into award season, there's films being released right before the end of the year, as well as other other you know just content because of the holidays, holiday breaks and coming up and things like that. So be sure to check all that out. In addition to that, you can follow us on Twitter and join our Discord to find all the articles that we talk about here on the podcast and some that we don't. You can follow us on Instagram for all the latest announcements related to new episodes of the podcast posting. You can also send us an email at thestreamingwars at gmail.com with any questions, comments, concerns, topics you'd like us to talk about on the future episodes, as well as future Feedback. You can also leave feedback wherever you're listening to this podcast. That is always greatly appreciated. With all of that being said, for Tony and myself, please continue to stay safe out there, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening to The Streaming Wars. Check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. Links can be found at thestreamingwars.io.